Welcome to Recover Strong, a show that will transform your recovery from an eating disorder by helping you go from theory to practice to mastery. I'm Jessica Flint, founder of Recovery Warriors, and you are listening to our podcast channel created specifically for you in all the stages and phases of recovery. I want to celebrate you for carving out this special time to learn new skills, tools, and get the inspiration you need to recover strong. Let's get started. Hello there, Warrior. I'm your host, Andrea Wells. And just like you, I understand what it's like to live with an eating disorder and be held back by body image struggles. The recovery journey is ongoing, and we're all in it together as we learn to embrace new behaviors and new thoughts day by day. Join me as I connect with eating disorder experts and thought leaders to give you the tools, resources, and strategies you need to recover strong. Today, we're talking about taking your power back around holiday desserts and treats. Now, for people with eating disorders, sweet and sugary foods can be very triggering. Desserts can be a fear food that you avoid or something that you're drawn to binge on. And this can be a difficult time of year with so many holiday gatherings happening that are filled with pies, cookies, cakes, puddings, you name it. And this episode first aired last year around this time, and we are bringing it back today to help you navigate dessert triggers and fears this holiday season. And this is a fun episode to revisit because it is one of our very first Five Things features that we ever did. And we were experimenting with the format and having some members from our team come on to share their experiences. So you'll be hearing from Recovery Warriors team members past and present. And while I've been behind the production of every show on the podcast channel, Behind the Scenes, This episode was the very first time that I appeared as a guest. And we have come so far as a podcast channel since then, and we love to experiment and let curiosity guide us to try new things. And we are continuing to evolve, particularly as we have decided it is better to pause the five things format moving forward and focus more on conversational interviews with experts and warriors with lived experience. And from our listener feedback, we know that the Five Things format was a favorite and we love doing it. It's original. It clarifies key learning objectives. At the same time, we have found it to be very heavy in resources to produce weekly. And we believe that you can get just as much value out of a more conversational format. And I am so excited to share the new episodes that we're working on to air in the new year. I am currently recording with some amazing guests and discussing topics that will help you to gain the tools and mindset shifts that you need to improve your relationship to food and body for a lasting recovery. At the end of the day, our mindset is everything. It can be the thing that makes or breaks your recovery. And that is why we have created the five-day mindset makeover for all you warriors. It is a repeatable step-by-step protocol to confidently put you in control of your recovery, even on those days when it feels really hard. So if you're feeling stuck or blocked from reaching your full potential when it comes to recovering from an eating disorder, go through the five-day mindset makeover at recoverywarriors.com slash mindset and get the boost you need to succeed. And if you're a podcast listener, you get 50% off the Mindset Makeover, including some other special holiday bonuses. To claim this offer, go to recoverywarriors.com slash mindset. Now let's get into our special throwback episode on taking back your power around desserts and sweets this holiday season. Today is a five things feature where you get more recovery wisdom in less time. Each week, we talk about five things related to recovery, whether that is five steps to improve your body image, five insecurities that are holding you back, or today's topic of five ways to take back your power from candy and desserts. Our featured wisdom sharing for this episode comes from Team Recovery Warriors. And I'm just so proud of our talented team of warriors here. Each person has a personal experience of battling an eating disorder and unique skills that match their passion for helping others find recovery. It's that time of year when sweets like candy and desserts come out in full force, whether it's at parties and family gatherings and social gatherings. It's just, it's a very common thing during this time of year to be faced with a lot of different 
food options, primarily sweets and candy and desserts. When you're struggling with eating disorder or stuck in the diet cycle, this can be an extra stressful time. Whether you feel guilt after eating sweets or just stressed about being around them or feel like you have to burn off what you ate the day before just to get back on track, all of this really does tie into the eating disorder and the struggle is real and it can make the holiday season a hard time to navigate. And that is why we're here to offer up some support and encouragement and lessons learned so you can do things differently this holiday season. Now let's explore five ways you can take back the power from candy and desserts this holiday season and beyond. Number one, ditch the good versus bad food mindset. To talk more about this, I first want to introduce you to Madeline. So I'm uh, Madeline, and I'm in charge of sort of media and design for Recovery Warrior. So I guess for anyone who doesn't really know what that means, that's anything that involves sort of branding, colors, creating editorial artworks, thumbnails, anything that's sort of a creative representation of the company. I struggled myself for over 10 years with anorexic bulimia, and obviously that really impacted my life first quite negatively for that time, and then at the same time quite positively after I went through recovery. And now that I'm fully recovered, it really feels, it feels pretty perfect. It feels really special that in a way I can, on the one hand, use my creative skills, which is something that I really enjoy. And that's really fun for me, but that I sort of have this feeling that at the end of that, in an, in an indirect way, I'm actually helping other people that might be on this journey that is quite challenging. Um, and if I can sort of be even a tiny part of helping anybody recover, then that's so meaningful and special to me. Y'all, it has been so cool to have Madeline be a part of our team because the brand has totally transformed and it's like finally come into its true colors. You know, it's out of the curlers, out of the bathrobe and is now the bell of the ball. And I am just, oh, And as you know, I love to say, we don't become our best selves by ourselves. And so together we've been able to fully embody the bold, authentic and creative brand that I always have known Recovery Warriors been at our core. And now with our brand more established, we're really able to radiate our essence of growth, depth, optimism, and freedom. Now, speaking of freedom, let's hear how ditching the good food versus bad food mindset was able to liberate Madeline from her eating disorder. For me, definitely, you know, sort of moral um, evaluation, I guess, of food was definitely a huge thing when I was really struggling with food. So anything that in my mind was considered a bad food or a wrong food. So anything that had a lot of sugar or a lot of fat or whatever, that was kind of like a no go. So for me, what was often hard is that, you know, if I was in a public setting, then that was like, no, I would try and stay away from that mainly also because I felt like there wasn't really a place for me to purge. I would just kind of have to live with it. I would just have excuses always ready to go. I don't like that. I'm not in the mood, whatever it was, which of course is really sad because there's a lot of moments in life where whatever, that's just part of it, whether it's a birthday cake or the family coming together to go for ice cream or anything like that. And then when I was alone, it was kind of like, you know, obviously when we forbid ourselves certain things, then they kind of become that much more tempting. So then when I was alone, it was kind of like all these foods that I would never allow myself to eat. I would, I would just want all of it. And then of course I would go overboard and then you don't feel good either. So that was, that was always kind of a a horrible, a horrible struggle. It was just awful. Like it's, it's awful to exclude an entire food group just because in your mind, you can't live with having it in your body. Like it's, it's crazy how when you look at it in retrospect, you know, it's it's so much easier to sort of spy that, I guess, or to like see it and to be like, wow, that's so crazy. But then when you're in really in it, it just feels so impossible. So that's really, I just, it felt impossible. I felt hopeless a lot of the time. I felt like I would never get out of it. I really often questioned if I would, I felt like I would always feel this way about food. And now, I mean, I, I some days I truly can't believe the extent to which I feel recovered. I really feel so free around food and it just doesn't have a hold over me anymore. Like I don't attach the same moral meaning to it anymore. Ice cream is just ice cream. 
cake is just cake. And if I feel like it, I will have a piece. If I want a second piece, I'll have a second piece. If I want a fifth piece, I'll have a fifth piece. If I don't want a piece, I won't have a piece. And it doesn't have to mean anything. And that like liberty is just so amazing that I get to feel that. I feel like I really do want to say when it comes to this is that recovery is possible. Like I really want anyone listening to this to hear that from somebody who did truly recover from a 10 year eating disorder because I experienced even health professionals that sort of implied that for a lot of people, full recovery isn't possible. And you might always, you know, slip back into these habits. And I know when I heard that, it just, it it was so hard because you you don't want to think of the rest of your life thinking, you know, when I'm 50, I'm going to be at someone's wedding and not want to eat the cake. That's just sad. So it is possible with the right team and the right support. And and if you want it, then you can 100% do it. Yes, recovery is 100% possible. This reminds me of one of our company core values at Recovery Warriors. And that is everything is figure outable. If at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again and be open to new ways of finding solutions. The mindset that got you into the eating disorder is not the mindset that will get you out of the eating disorder. Now let's move along to the next way to take back your power from candy and desserts. Number two, fuel your body regularly. To talk more about this, I first want to introduce you to Manaya. My name is Minaya Gora, and I'm originally from Madrid in Spain, where I'm currently living. I've been living abroad for quite a few years, actually, and I came back to my hometown, which is about half an hour away from Madrid and really close to the mountains. And I love it here. (laughs) I've been working for Recovery Warriors for about two and a half years now. And I'm in charge of online marketing and web design. And I'm just so happy to be part of this this team. And and I get to work with really inspiring women. And I get to contribute with my work to help others to heal their relationship to food and body. And it's just really fulfilling for me to to be part of this mission and and this team. Manaya is always down to learn new things and I absolutely love it. I've literally thrown everything her way over the years and she embraces the everything is figure outable mindset and quickly learns new softwares and skills. She also embodies another one of our company core values and that is growth happens in phases. Not only has Manaya grown professionally, but she has also shed away the thinking that kept her trapped in an eating disorder and has been able to restore her health. Let's hear what Manai has to say about sweets and fueling her body regularly. So my relationship with sweets and candy has been somewhat of a complicated one, more especially with carbs in general and and sweets in particular. I've never really been someone who really enjoys sweets, but coming from a history of restrictive dieting and compensatory behaviors, I came to a point, I was desperate when I was in the depth of my eating disorders, I was desperate to find a way out. And I came across the blog post where it said that for regulating your blood sugar levels and your eating habits, it was really helpful to quit sugar. So uh, I thought it was a good idea at the moment. Uh, (laughs) Hint, it wasn't. (laughs) And I went cold turkey with it. I removed sugar completely from my life. And the funny thing is, I, as I said before, I wasn't someone who used to have sweets that much. But the moment I removed it from my diet and I didn't allow myself to have it, it was as if I just couldn't stop thinking about it. And, and sweets was the only thing that I wanted to have. And I would like look at photos and, 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 and it was completely crazy. And suddenly sweet had this, this power over me, which they had never had before. 
so it actually took me some time to to realize how unhealthy this was and how it was not helping me at all. It was actually disconnecting me even more with with my hunger cues and disconnect and unregulating my blood sugar levels. So I had to give it up and I had to start allowing uh, sugar and carbs back into my life. And it wasn't until I I started allowing them that I had some power back and that I felt that I could have it if I wanted. I could not have it if I didn't want it. And I was in control of it. Not in control in a compulsive, unhealthy way, but in control as in I was in touch again with my hunger cues and I could decide whether I wanted it or not. My piece of advice is actually two things that I think that come hand in hand. The first one is to, I'm sure you have heard this like a million times because you hear this in recovery over and over again, but I, I can't say it enough. Eat regularly, you know, eat nutrient dense food regularly so that your, food, your, your body has enough fuel and enough power to, to function properly. Because otherwise, it's, it's just normal that you're going to have all these cravings and you're going to be like looking for sugar and, 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 and fast energy because your body is not, not functioning well. So first, regulate your meals and then start allowing more freedom into your routine with food. So the more you control your food, the more it's going to control you. So if you really want to have some power over your your eating habits, then you have to. You have to allow freedom and, and to let your body tell you what it wants and what it needs and, and listen to it. The more you control your food, the more it will control you. That phrase is worth repeating again and writing down and jotting down. The more you control your food, the more it will control you. When you fuel your body regularly, meaning you keep your body biologically fed with adequate energy and carbohydrates, you are way less likely to trigger a primal drive to overeat. The more you deny your true hunger and fight your natural biology, the stronger and more intense food cravings and obsessions become. Now let's move on to our next way to take back your power from candy and desserts. Number three, let go of guilt. To talk more about this, I first want to introduce you to Miriam. Hi, everyone. My name is Miriam Mainland, and I'm the chief editor at Recovery Warriors. So I've personally struggled with anorexia nervosa during my 20s, and there were a lot of moments at which I thought I would never recover. So when I was able to find my way through and recover, I was determined to do something with this experience. And so... I decided to move away from working in the financial services industry, and it became my main goal to continue to encourage other people who are struggling that recovery is possible, and more importantly, that it's worth it. So that's when I started my work at Recovery Warriors back in 2014. Miriam is amazing. We balance each other's strengths and weaknesses very well. One strength of Miriam's is her commitment to completing a task well and on time. She holds herself to high standards, and she loves to see our numbers improve. So that's like our web traffic, our podcast listeners, whatever stat there is, she loves to see it grow and improve. Now, all of these are super skills professionally, but when turned towards an eating disorder, they can lead to a downward spiral of rigidly enforced rules and hyper-focus on numbers. Let's hear how Miriam was able to lighten up on her rules, let go of guilt, and in doing so, no longer feeling stressed out around food. Okay, so when I was struggling with anorexia, situations that involved a lot of candy and desserts were just very stressful for me, and especially if it were types of candy or desserts that I loved. For example, things with chocolate, because I really like that stuff, and I had such strict rules for myself, and so being exposed to those things that I desperately wanted but didn't allow myself created this huge like, internal conflict in my mind. And I always knew that ultimately I would just want to eat the dessert. And usually I would even end up 
doing it. But then I already knew that the next day I was going to feel so guilty. And this is where just a lot of the destructive eating disorder behaviors would come in for me. So like the restricting, the over-exercising, the thoughts and the shame and the compensations. And it was this complicated, vicious cycle. And, you know, this is the start of the holiday season. And I always reflect back on those years in which this time was nothing but stressful for me. And I grew up in the Netherlands and between Thanksgiving and Christmas, we celebrate this holiday called Sinterklaas, which has always been and still is my favorite holiday, especially now that I have my own kids. And my mom used to always bake these special cookies. They're sort of like I guess gingerbread cookies in the US, but traditionally you have these really big molds that create gigantic doll shaped cookies. I know it sounds a little bit weird, but if you see it, it's not that weird. So she would make those and we would typically eat them the day that you could see the arrival of Sinterklaas on television. And it was just our tradition. But when I had an eating disorder, things were so black and white for me. So the whole week prior to this, I would feel nervous and stressed. And again, it was just that internal conflict in my mind. And I always felt like on those days, I would just have to let myself, quote unquote, go and then make up for it later. And it obviously was a very harmful way of, of looking at food and it would just cause stress and anxiety. And it just took away a lot of the joy. And especially on those moments that should be fun and that should be a time to be with you know, your family. In recovery, I learned so much about what was underneath my eating disorder and why I used food as a way of coping and dealing with, you know, insecurities and my lack of self-worth. And and working through all those things really took away all that power that food once had over me, like all that power that it had over me for like eight years. And so things over time like shifted. And I would notice that in situations that used to cause a lot of stress before, I, I no longer had the same reaction and holidays just became fun and enjoyable again. And I'm now at this point where I just can't imagine food having that power over me, which to me is great. And it also shows that recovery really is possible. You really can get through an eating disorder and recovery really is possible. Even when you truly believe it's not, and you just feel really, really low, there is a way out to the other sides. You can break on through to the other side. Breakdowns always lead to breakthroughs if you're willing to stay committed to the process. Now let's move on to our next way to take back your power from candy and desserts. Number four, embrace intuitive eating. To talk more about this, I first want to introduce you to Andrea. My name is Andrea. I'm the podcast producer at Recovery Warriors. So I work on things like audio editing, script writing, and a few different tasks behind the scenes to help the shows run. Um, This work is important to me because I'm in recovery myself. So I know all the things that an eating disorder takes from you. I know what the hell it is. Um, And I know all the things that you get back and the better life you can live during recovery. So being able to have my job be something where I help people with this stuff is very special. And it's very important work that I do not take lightly. Andrea initially applied for an executive assistant position. And when I was reviewing her resume, I literally spit my coffee out on the paper because I was so shocked to see her extensive background in radio and broadcasting. It was a dream come true to have her resume get on to my radar and have her apply because just at that moment, the vision for the Recovery Warrior shows was beginning to take form. Andrea plays a pivotal role in helping us make our motto of many voices, one journey come to life through our podcast and our editorial. Andrea also brings a unique perspective of being in recovery while managing a health condition. Let's listen to her story and lessons learned. So I'm about five years into recovery and like I've embraced intuitive eating and it was going really well until I hit a bump in the road, which was about two years ago. And that was because I was diagnosed with type two diabetes. So that was really triggering because I had gotten like comfortable with the idea that food is not the devil and it's not going to kill me or harm me. And I was finally making peace with that. But then suddenly I'm facing a situation where that's changed. (laughs) Um, And, you know, I had doctors prescribing weight loss and all of the usual diet culture stuff. 
and uh, starting to have my blood sugar measured, which to me was very reminiscent of, you know, like counting calories and weighing yourself. And then suddenly sweets and candy had become like a forbidden fruit once again. You know, there wasn't a ton of information out there about how to practice intuitive eating when you have diabetes, but I sought out what was there. I just want to make it really clear, like, I'm not a doctor. (laughs) This is not medical advice. Um, I'm just sharing things that I have done that have worked for me in my situation. So one thing that I knew right away after diagnosis was that I was not going to pursue intentional weight loss as a diabetes treatment. I knew that would not work. But I was struggling with feeling like my unconditional permission to eat was taken away from me, particularly when it came to sugar and sweets, candy, carbs. But one day it dawned on me that like, no, I still do have unconditional permission to eat these things. I can eat all the carbs and sugar I want. And yes, because of this disease, it will raise my blood sugar and that can cause symptoms. And that has an impact on my physical health. Like, you know, all these things are true. But ultimately, there's no law saying I can't go ahead and do all of that and eat all the sugar in the world. <laughs> um, but I do value my physical health. And diabetes is one of those exceptions to the notion that food will not harm your health. But that doesn't mean that I have to live by eating disorder rules either. I didn't realize those things right away. For the first few months, I was terrified of eating sweets. Uh, Like I didn't eat any candy or dessert or anything for months. Uh, But I wanted to work on that. And my birthday was coming up. So I was planning to have a birthday cupcake. And I was scared. I was convinced that I'd eat that cupcake and my blood sugar would be sky high and it would be dangerous. But it was actually the lowest had been since I was diagnosed because I had like panic ate a bunch of turkey before I ate the cupcake and protein reduces blood sugar spikes. Uh, I was just kind of shocked by that, (laughs) that no, I didn't go blind or have a heart attack because my blood sugar was so high. It was actually, it was okay. And it really showed me that I can have diabetes and sweets and be okay. So I decided kind of from that point out that I would no longer be restricting myself from sugar Instead, I just told myself that I'm going to embrace sugar and fiber and protein all at the same time. There's room for all of it. And this was kind of leaning into like the gentle nutrition aspect of intuitive eating, because that does come into play in recovery, whether you have diabetes or not. But I, yeah, I continue to eat sweets and candy and I still enjoy them regularly. We're just over two years later now. And for the most part, I feel much better about eating candy and sweets And my diabetes is quite well managed. Um, I want to refrain from using like numbers. I don't want to trigger anyone, but I do remain uh, symptom free and my situation with diabetes is still mild. And that is without restriction from sweets, without weight loss. Anyway, I'm, I'm proud of the work that I've done with reconciling intuitive eating and diabetes. It is not perfect. Of course, nothing is. Um, I do have days still where I feel terrified about sugar and sweets again and I'm feeling triggered, but that's maybe five or 10% of the time now. And the other 90 to 95%, like I'm feeling good about my relationship with food overall. And I love that. Whether you have a health condition like diabetes or celiac disease that uh, actually does affect your health with food, um, or if you don't, or if you're just in regular recovery, you can still make peace with sweets and candy and have it fit into your life and not have sugar be the boogeyman when you have diabetes. What a powerful story. I remember when I was diagnosed with PCOS, which is stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome, and all of the medical literature I read said, do not eat sugar and avoid carbohydrates. And I was at the time still actively in recovery when I got this diagnosis. And man, it threw me for a loop. Here I was trying to step forward in my recovery and you know reject diet mentality and really start to honor my hunger signals and embrace intuitive eating. And then at the same time, I'm being told to eat a restrictive diet. Like Andrea, with time, I was able to find the balance. What's important to remember here is that intuitive eating is possible while managing a health condition. When you drop the all or nothing mentality, you make room for more possibilities to take care of your overall well-being. Now, let's move on to our last way to take back your power from candy and desserts. Number five, come out of hiding. I'll bring us home with this last way to take your power back. When I reflect back on the years that I lived with an eating disorder, I found that there was a a pattern or a theme that would come up a lot. And that is that I often 
ate secretly or in hiding. Or if I did eat around people, it'd be like just a little bit. Like I would have a little tiny bit, but when I was by myself, I would have much bigger portions. And this would often lead me to then binge eat. And at certain points of my eating disorder history, I would also engage in purging behaviors. And the foods that I often turned towards were very sweet, like brownies and ice cream and cake and pretty much anything to do with pastries, I absolutely loved. And I remember one time I was living in this beach house in San Diego and I was living with four other girls. So it's five of us total. And my Hawaiian roommate, Mahina, uh, she made this amazing dish called pumpkin crumble. And it was so good. And it was this family tradition of hers, like this recipe, really like I kind of wish I could have it now because it was the bomb. And she made this huge pan of pumpkin crumble, a massive pan of pumpkin crumble. At the time I was, you know, on, I was struggling with my eating disorder. I was on this low calorie diet, totally deprived of sugar and carbohydrates. And there was this huge dish of pumpkin crumble and it was so tempting to me. And my room was the closest to the kitchen. And it's all I could think about. It was just like sitting there like, hello, Jessica, I'm your pumpkin crumble. Come meet me. Every ounce of me was just trying to resist not having this. And I ended up going to bed that night still in this state of resistance and like, no, and uh, I want some. And that pumpkin crumble was on my mind big time. And I ended up waking up and in this kind of pseudo state of slumber, I just devoured (laughs) the whole pan of the pumpkin crumble. I ended up eating the whole freaking pan except for this like t- <laughs> tiny little sliver. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I just laugh at like the absurdity of this like massive pan and then I'm just like, I'll just leave a little tiny bit in case they want some. <laughs> When I woke up, I had these crumbles in my sheets and I was just totally like hungover from eating a whole massive pan of this dessert. I mean, I went from like, I'm not going to have a single serving to I'm going to have like 35 servings of this. (laughs) And oh, man, I was so ashamed because I mean, it was kind of obvious that like somebody ate the pumpkin crumble. I mean, it was there the night before and then in the morning, all of it was there the night before and I was just, once again, just so ashamed to say that it it was me. And I tried to laugh it off, like, and say, like, oh, I had the drunchies, which is like when you're drunk and you overeat, you know, the munchies, but when you're drunk. And I mean, that wasn't the case. I was totally sober when I went to bed. I was just biologically starving. And, you know, this experience sticks out as a story I can share, but this was not an isolated event. I mean, this was actually a common occurrence for me to wake up in the middle of the night and eat. It was a huge cause of concern for me because I felt really out of control. Like I was not really fully conscious. I was in a somewhat of like a dream state. You know, I felt like I didn't have my full decision-making uh, faculties, but I have hundreds and hundreds of more times that I was fully conscious and I still would secretly sneak the food. The more people I lived with, the easier it was for me to sneak foods and kind of go unnoticed. And I would, you know, I would often just like take a little sliver here and a little sliver there. And I would go to such great lengths to hide this behavior. Uh, I would take the wrappers and I would go put them in another trash can somewhere else or just really plunge them deep into the trash so they'd be covered. Or I would go to the store and I'd refill what I ate and like restocking and trying to get it to the same level it was. And Sometimes they wouldn't have what I needed at the store and I'd freak out and have to go to another store. I mean, the amount of energy and time that I placed in like covering up my tracks was uh, exhausting. And, and, and a huge shift happened for me, and this was a big part of my recovery, was when I started to come out of hiding and not eat sweets secretly. So this meant that I had to vocalize my intentions for the food. So if I wanted something, I had to ask for it. If it wasn't mine, I would have to ask for it. Or if it was mine or it was something that was communal and everybody could have it, I would let it be known that I'm having it. In some ways, I was vocalizing my permission to eat the food. So for example, if someone someone had a dessert that I wanted, I would ask permission instead of sneaking it. So let's say my roommate made a pan of brownies. I would ask him. I'd say, hey, Brandon, these look amazing. Can I have one? 
instead of just tiptoeing around at night, you know, having a little sliver of the bounty and like shaving off like a little corner so it goes unnoticed. With this, I also had to confront the inner food police whose sirens would start to be like, you can't eat that. But I recognize that I would be in some ways like the thief at night who's trying to hide from the food police. And so when I just sat there and I acknowledged that I'm going to eat this, I was directly saying to the food police, I'm going to eat this, even though you're telling me I'm breaking a rule. And the thief who wants to go do this behind the back and not get caught by the food police when it's secret, it was challenging. I had to really say, hey, I'm going to have a piece of pie now. I'm going to have this cookie. I would be afraid that people would be like, why is she talking about that? Really, I didn't have any awkward situations with it. People would be like, okay, cool. That looks good. But it was a huge thing for me to publicly state what I wanted, what I was going to do with that food and not eat it behind closed doors in hiding. And so I started to be able to eat these sweets in public and change the way I interact with them in private. And in doing so, I was able to work through a lot of the shame scripts that I'm not trustworthy around food. So to review, the five ways you can take back your power from candy and desserts are to ditch the good food versus bad food mindset, fuel your body regularly, let go of guilt, embrace intuitive eating, and come out of hiding. Ultimately, when you give yourself permission to eat, including candy and desserts and all those things that you convince yourself are off limits, they suddenly lose their power over you. And when those foods no longer have power over you, you create mental space to live a life that isn't dependent on what you can or cannot eat. So really, this holiday season and beyond, enjoy the treats. Allow yourself to eat the Halloween candy, Thanksgiving pies, and Christmas cakes and cookies. Take back that power that all the eating disorder rules and beliefs and chronic dieting took away from you all these years. Make a commitment to start walking on a new path, one that doesn't end in guilt and beating yourself up. A path of full permission. Well, my warrior friend, thank you for having the discipline to listen in. If you found this episode helpful and know somebody in recovery who could benefit from its inspiring message, please share this show with them. It would mean the world to us at Recovery Warriors if we can get our cause out to more people struggling with an eating disorder. So if what you heard today was helpful, share the show with another warrior or anyone on your treatment team. You can do this directly from your podcast player or send them over to recoverywarriors.com. We have a goldmine of free resources there for all stages of recovery. And until the next episode, may compassion light the path you are on and courage keep you on it. You totally got this warrior. <laughs>